That's all you got. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. I just got from camp, so uh, this is the quietest service I've been in all week. It's, uh, it was so loud that it was 11 miles from Asheville, and I think people in Asheville were thinking the shuttle was going off because they had the subwoofer so loud in that building. So I still feel rumbling from that, but it's a great experience. And, um, you know, what does God want to do with ordinary you? He can do extraordinary things. You may not even feel ordinary. You may feel broken and messed up. And God can use you. The only people, if you look in Scripture, that God doesn't use are people who think they have it together. It's the Saul's who think, I'm a little taller, a little smarter, a little better than other people. And then there's the David. And the Davids in the Bible are the ones who knew they were broken and maybe shorter than other people and didn't quite have it together. David, it said, was ruddy in appearance, a little freckled face boy who didn't have it all together, just a shepherd. And yet he was humble before God, and that's the reason God used him. God can use you. It doesn't have to do with your perfection or having it together or how many things you have right. It has to do with you being humble and saying, God, use me, ordinary, broken, messed up me to do what only you can do. Today as we end this series, we've been talking about strong and courageous in the book of Joshua. And if you want to follow along in your Bibles or if you have a Bible app on your phone, we're going to kind of walk through it pretty straight. So if you get to the book of Joshua, if you want to turn there, it's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. It's the sixth book. It's about page 200 on a lot of Bibles, just so you know. Somebody told me that last night. So we were at camp this week and... Uh, Seven kids made commitments to Christ, which is phenomenal. And uh, yeah, you can cheer that, okay? And, uh, and just so you know, you know, I know you're sitting there and you're going, well, I've been to camps where they just manipulate people. One night, the speaker, before he even got up to speak, said, um, I just feel like some kids need to give their lives to Christ, so if you need to, just go to youth pastor. I mean, he said it literally just like that. Two kids came to me and said, I want to give my life to Christ tonight. And I'm like, dude, the important part hasn't even happened yet. <laughs> I always joke with Neil because a lot of pastors joke about, you know, the, the music's the setup. Listen, God can speak to you during the uh, worship time and the music as much as he can in the message, sometimes more. So you just let God speak to you. So anyway, so that happens. And as I was there, there was one night um, where the kids just all went forward. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, all over the place, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids just on their knees and on their faces before God, asking God to do great things in their life. Now, you've got to realize that, that before that happened, on Monday I got a text. Hey, uh, two of the boys that are on this trip, um, their cousin was in a serious accident. is in critical condition in the hospital. And the next night I got, hey, their cousin passed away. Don't tell them. So I'm sitting there in the meeting. I'm looking at those two boys and thinking, God, they just need you. And those two boys, one of them gave their life to Christ, the other one had already committed to Christ, and they both were down there. And I'm looking up there, and I see all those kids, and I, I think, God, you're so good. That night, I got an email, a Facebook message, from a former student. And as I was sitting there watching this, I said, I've not seen that in 20 years. I mean, I, I've been to youth camps over and over again. I, I, I've gone to a lot of youth camps the last 25 years of ministry, and even as an older youth in school. And this is one of the only times that I've seen God really move this way in students. And as I was looking at that, I thought, man, I remember my students years ago. And one of the students from years ago had no idea that was going on. She emailed me, Facebook noted me, and said, Eric, did you know I got saved at student life camp? She said, do you remember? <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, I remember. Let me tell you her story real quick. Her name is Christine. Um, and she came to the youth group. I'll never forget this because she came with a guy that, um, exactly, that is a perfect place. That's how I felt about that guy. I just thank you for your illustration. By the way, this is Baby Sunday. We've got about five babies in the service and one any minute. So um, if you if you got some towels or something, just in case, just be ready. Any paramedics? We do have nurses here. Your guys are on call today. So if you hear screaming, head that way right there, okay? So, hey, baby, I'll see you in a few weeks. I love it when babies, when they first, like, are born, and I walk into the room, they go, I know that voice. I mean, it sounded more like this, but I still know. <laughs> I'm 
sounds kind of like this, but I don't know what this is. So. So Christine did not come from a Christian home. And I remember, now this is me as a youth pastor. I'm 20-something years old. And I remember she came home with this guy, and I wanted to go to her. Don't go to her. Stay away from her. Because uh, I knew him, and he was a doofus in the Greek, doofaso. And, uh, and so I remember her coming in with him. She came from a home, didn't know anything about Jesus. Her family did not go to church, did not talk about Jesus, anything. She didn't know anything. She came to camp. Now, you got to understand, when a guy and a girl come to camp, as a youth pastor, you get your leaders together and you go, come here, come here. And all the squirrels in my head said, you have to have a meeting. Yes, I have to have a meeting. Yes, you do. Okay. So I bring all the youth leaders together. All right, huddle, huddle. Now listen, we've got a boyfriend and girlfriend alert. What? Boyfriend and girlfriend alert. If you see them headed for woods, if you see them headed alone anywhere, take them down. So that's what you do. So you spend camp time, and anybody who's done a youth camp knows that's exactly what you do. You, you're like, oh, no, 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 where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Oh, okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Are they, where are, they? Are, they are they here? Are they here? Are they here? Run outside. Oh, you're in the bathroom. Okay, good. Okay. Just came to check on you. No big deal. That was great. You know, and it's okay if one of them's gone. If one of them's gone, you're like, nah, he's not here yet. It's okay. But if both of them are gone, it's like, okay. We do not want a problem in nine months. Where are those children? <laughs> Go get them. Anyway, so, uh, so I remember. Trust me, I remember. So we were at, I, and I remember when these kids were up front. Here's what I remember. I remember her going forward at, at Covenant College in Tennessee and going onto the steps and praying. And I thought, has she just had a bad week? Or, you know, because you don't know. And then I remember one of the ladies, Mrs. Bush, the uh, Diane Bush, one of the youth leaders, went up and prayed with her and started crying, and they were crying. I'm a youth pastor, so I said, women. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yes, okay. Yes, okay. It was wrong of me, but I did. Okay, so, and then Mrs. Bush goes, come here, come here. And I'm like, uh-oh, they're calling for backup, right? So I go in, and she says, uh, I want to give my life to Christ. And I almost wanted to go, Really? <laughs> She gave her life to Christ. So when she connected with me on Facebook just a few years ago, she wrote me this note. She said, Eric, I want you to know I gave my life to Christ. I now have three children. I'm raising them in a Christian home. I play piano for church, and I teach Sunday school every single week. And she sends me a note. Eric, do you remember what happened? And as I'm seeing seven kids who said, I've given my life to Christ. I've taken that next step. And then other kids who are saying, I've recommitted my life to Christ. Listen, I know when God's moving, when a kid comes to me and says, I need to go home and apologize to my parents. <laughs> you what? Yeah, I just, I need to, I've been kind of rude. I need to go apologize. <laughs> I'm sure when they got home, their parents, Elizabeth, I'm coming, right? And if you don't know what that is, you're too young. Okay, so, so this happens at camp this week, and I see these kids, and I realize, and, and, and I don't know if it was me or one of the leaders, Erica, took a, a picture of the kids at the altar, and I'm going to get that picture, and I want to put it in my office to remind me of what God has done, because you and I need reminders of what God's done, so that in the present, when the enemy comes to you and says, you are worthless, when you wake up tomorrow morning and you go, you're not doing good. Every pastor that I know wakes up on Monday morning and Satan comes and goes, you know, you really shouldn't be a pastor. And a lot of us go, this is true. So today I want to encourage you if you're discouraged. Some of you, instead of being strong and courageous, feel weak and discouraged. So I hope today as we walk through the book of Joshua just real quick and I'll just hit on some highlights and some high notes and that maybe you can say, God... Would you change my heart? Like the song said, put a, bring a fire that I can't control. I, I can't control it. You're, you're taking over my life. So let's look today. Five important truths from the book of Joshua. Number one, I can trust God with each change and challenge. So this is in Joshua chapter one. And Joshua's already been told by Moses, be strong and courageous. He's told by God, be strong and courageous. In a minute, he gets told by the people, be strong and courageous. You know why? Because he didn't feel strong and courageous. You have to realize that Joshua was one of the spies that went into the promised land. And the last time he went into the promised land, he and Caleb came back and said, hey, we need to go in. 
And the other spy said, uh uh-uh. There are big people there. We look like grasshoppers to them. And they blew out of proportion. And then the next day, Aaron and Moses came to the people and said, no, no, we need to go into the promised land. And you know what the people did? Instead of going, yes, let's go. They said, no, let's kill Moses and Aaron and go back to Egypt. And then God had to come in and all kinds of things went on that weren't good. And so I am sure as Joshua was getting ready again to say to them, we're getting ready to go, that I am sure, because I know anytime God moves in your life and in my life, this is exactly what happens. And if you're being uh, haunted and if, and if you're feeling oppressed and if you're sensing that you're a failure, I can tell you right now it's because God is getting ready to do something great. Because here's the deal. I am sure when he got ready to cross, he thought, oh no. Joshua, do you remember what happened last time? But that's not going to happen this time. Joshua, you know, Moses was a great leader. He grew up in Pharaoh's house. He knew how to write and how to talk and all the things to do. He knew diplomacy. He was taught how to rule. And you were born a slave. Be strong and courageous. Listen to what it says in this passage. Be strong and courageous. Do not be Afraid. Some of you need to just take that part of the verse and put it on your refrigerator. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. By the way, you know why it says that over and over? Because he was. They weren't just telling him something he didn't need to know. <laughs> Nobody comes to you and says, don't be discouraged when you're not discouraged. That would be an odd thing to just walk up to somebody and say, don't be discouraged. Um, I'm really having a good day. Is there something I should be discouraged about that I, right? You don't say that to somebody who's not discouraged. Who do you say it to? Somebody who's discouraged says, don't be afraid. Why? Because he was afraid. Don't be discouraged. Why? Because he was discouraged. I don't know how this is going to go. Can you ask her if she'll pretend to turn the air back on? That would be great. All right. (laughs) Don't be discouraged. Why? Listen, listen. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. New Testament equivalent is when Jesus said to the disciples, I will never leave you or forsake you. That means that if you're a Christian and you're here today, the Holy Spirit lives in you and God is with you wherever you go, wherever you put your foot. That's why it's important. We do prayer walks. Why? Because we know God is with us. So we need to do a prayer walk. We're saying, God, whatever is here, you bring your spirit here. God, you change lives. That's why you should be walking around your neighborhood and praying for your neighbors. And you should do like I do when I get here in the morning. I park and I walk around the whole park and I say, God, you work in people's lives here today. Why? Because God is with me. Because I deserve it. And 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 you don't either. You don't deserve it. You didn't do anything to earn it. What happened? Jesus died for you. And so he said, I will be with you always. So on the worst day, in the worst emotion, in the worst feeling, God says, I will be with you. So let me ask you this. What is your challenge? Is it a test result? Is it a relationship with a family member? Is it a work-related thing? Is it a relationship thing? What in your life is your challenge? What's the thing that you think, I don't want to deal with that? What's the thing in your life that you go, oh no, there it comes, there comes, I know it's on the way. Like you see the light at the end of the tunnel and you hear, choo-choo, right? And you're thinking, what do I do with that? That's my sister Kelly who has 10 children. She always laughs at me. <laughs> Part of the reason is because she's lost her mind, but you know. <laughs> how many of your children are here, Kelly? But you don't even know how many kids? I think eight. Okay. <laughs> We have 8 out of 10, 2 are lost, but we're glad you're here this morning. She only has 7 here, okay. Just to make you feel better, we were in the van getting ready to leave. I asked Erica, how many kids do you have? She said, 4. I asked our van, how many kids do we have? They said, 12. I said, okay, we're taking extra kids home, so that'll be good. Long as there's more, we're good. They're all going to get there, so. I don't know who ended up coming home with us, but we had extras. I'm like, we didn't have that many. So here's what I want you to say. Last night they said it like a cult. I am not kidding. I told them to say this and they went. And here's what I'm going to have you say. God is with me. All right? You're going to say that in a minute. Last night I said for them to say that and I promise it went like this. God is with me. I was like, you people are scaring me. I felt like it was like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. You know, it's like, God is with me. And also with you. You know, I don't know what that was. So, so we're going to say it like human beings. God is with me. Ready? One, two, three. God is with me. 
can you remember that? When life is going bad and things are hard, you are broken. What's the next point? I am broken. But God can use me. By the way, the only time God can't use you is when you forget that you're broken. Just The people God uses are people who are humble. Not people who are like, you know, God, thank you that I am not like that other sinner over there who's praying. <laughs> That's a story Jesus told, by the way. Jesus told a story about two people praying. And the one guy's going, Lord, forgive me. I'm broken and messed up. And the other guy's going, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like that guy. <laughs> so if this morning you're thinking of somebody that you're a little better than, <clears throat> God can't use you. But when you realize that you're broken, that's when he can use you. Because God makes broken messes into masterpieces. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. I'm going to tell you the Rahab story. We're just going to leave that camped up there for a minute. So Rahab was a prostitute in this big town. This big town of people who were terrorists. They really, they were bad, bad Leroy Brown people. These were people you did not want to hang around. You didn't want to mess with. These were people, if they had bombs at that time, they would have set off bombs in your camp. They would come in and kill people. They killed people, tortured them horrible ways. They went in and raided people traveling. It was horrible. The city of Jericho, these people were bad. And God says, let me see, who can I choose? Oh, yeah, I'll take that prostitute. What? Yeah, yeah, the, the prostitute. Yeah, the one that's got some people there right now. We're going to kick them out, and the spies are going to hide there. What? And she protects them. Listen to what happens. So the king sends the message. This is the king who killed people. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spout the whole land. And you know what she did? She said, oh, they already took off. Even though she hit him. She hit him on the roof underneath the grain. You know why she hit him underneath the grain? Because that's what she had. God wants to use what you have, not what you don't have. God's going to use where you're at, not where you're not. So ask God to use you right where you're at with who you are. And quit saying that you're a sinner. Because when you become a Christian, your identity is no longer a sinner. You've been made righteous in Christ. Let me give you an example. If I was drowning down here and you came and you pulled me out of the water and you pulled me up here and I went, <coughs> and I started feeling better. And then I went, as I stood up here, I went, I'm drowning. You would look at me and you would go, we have Prozac. It'll be okay. Right? Because you would think I'm crazy for pretending I'm drowning when I'm not. Here's the problem with Christians. Jesus, the Bible says, has saved you from your sins. Right? You've heard that verse. And then we go, I'm a sinner. And Jesus is like, um, we're not. We're not. We have to quit saying we're a sinner and realize that we've been made a saint. Not because you're righteous or smart enough. It's not like, I'm a saint and you're not. <laughs> It, it's because you realize I'm broken. I messed up. But Jesus was sent to die for me. Gave his life for me. Why? So he could take me from the kingdom of darkness and put me in the kingdom of righteousness. No longer am I a slave to sin, the Bible says. But I've been made a saint. Look it up in scripture. A saint's not just somebody you prayed to or somebody said, oh, they did a miracle. Isn't that? If you look in the Bible, because you're a Christian, you're a saint. And Jesus even said, I call you brothers and sisters, of course. The highest form of worship, Billy Graham said, is unselfish Christian service. The greatest form of praise is the sound of consecrated feet seeking out the lost and helpless. Do you serve other people or do you just serve yourself? How do you look at people that are broken? Do you think, man, I'm just glad I'm not like them? Or do you think God used me? Now, now let me give you um, um, some, some uh, instructions for the ditch. Because you're going to be walking down the road and you're going to come across somebody who's in the ditch that you feel like God wants you to help. Okay? Like the Good Samaritan who helped the guy who was beat up on the side of the road. And you're going to come. Maybe they have a drug addiction or maybe they have an alcohol problem. And let me tell you what will happen. You'll go over and help them. Some of those people, you'll be like, where'd they go? Oh, they're back in the ditch. They like the ditch. Sometimes you have to let those people stay in the ditch. Sometimes you have to let them stay in the ditch until they feel the weight of being in the ditch until they're really ready to get out of the ditch. But because, listen, sometimes when I pull people out of the ditch, can I tell you what they do? They punch me in the face and get back in the ditch. And I have a choice at that point. Am I going to quit helping people because that last person wasn't nice to me when I helped them? Or am I going to say, Jesus, I serve you. You went to the cross. The least I can do is take a punch in the face. Help me to find the balance of not enabling somebody, but helping someone to find their way home to Christ. And by the way, if you're in the ditch, you need to get to the point that you're ready to get out of the ditch. 
and begin to beg God for help and get people around you that can help because sometimes it takes more than one person to pull you out of the ditch. Some of your problems are heavier than one of us can handle and you need a group of people to pull you out of the ditch. So what do we pray? God, give me your eyes. God, give me your eyes for people. When's the last time you prayed that? God, help me to see people like you see them. When you see a mom come that brings her little child and she's on drugs like I saw this week, you don't think, what an irresponsible mother. I'm glad I'm not like that mother. No, I say, Lord, please, first of all, help this child. They're growing up in a, in a neighborhood. They're seeing drug use. They're seeing abuse. They're seeing all these things. Help them. And then, Father, would you help this mom to realize she needs to find her way home to you? Help her to know that there's more joy in Christ than there is in drugs. Number three, I need reminders of past miracles. I am the most forgetful person you know. ADD is not a good thing for reminding me of things. It reminds me of things at the wrong times, like middle of the night. <gasps> I forgot to call them back. But the little squirrels in my head a lot of times have meetings without me. So I go out and I put the clothes in the washing machine and I walk away and I think, i got to get that in 30 minutes. And three days later I go, where's my clothes? What's that smell? And then I'm, I, listen, I'm so bad that I take them and let's say I set my timer because I'm smart. So now I know I'm broken. So I go, Siri, set timer for 30 minutes. Setting timer for 30 minutes. Thank you, Siri. In 30 minutes I hear, boo 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 I'm like, oh, I gotta go get my clothes out of the, look, a squirrel. <laughs> but sometimes I actually get my clothes out, I put them in the dryer, and then there's too many. There's too many because I don't want to drop them at all. I don't mind dropping the wet ones, but the wet ones, we can't drop those. So I take half and I head to the, I head to the house. And then I go, squirrel, right? And I forget what I'm doing. And then three days later, I'm going, where's my clothes? Oh yeah, the other half's in the dryer. I go back out to the dryer. Right? You ever lost your glasses and they're on your head? I can't find them anywhere. I don't know where they are. You ever lost your phone on your phone? Have you seen my phone? Kids, anybody? Does anybody see? I don't know. I can't find my phone anywhere. You're talking to me on the phone. Oh, thanks. You helped me find it. Appreciate it. We are forgetful. Are you forgetful? Anybody in here forgetful? Let's just be honest. I see those hands. Yes, I see that hand. Raise it up over there, brother. Raise it up, sister. Yes, yes. Jesus loves you right there. Confession of sin is powerful. This is a powerful time. This is revival that's happening right here. We are forgetful people, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for serving. So good to have you here. So you need reminders of what God's done. You and I need reminders of what God... You're here. You're alive. Have you noticed? Wait, make sure. Okay, we're good. Listen to what it says here. So Joshua chapter 4, here's what happens. They go through the Jordan and God says, go set up some rocks in the middle as a reminder that we came through and God blessed us on the way through because you're getting ready to go into Jericho and it's going to get tough and you need to look back and go, look what God did because look what he's going to do. Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. The stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. First of all, the Bible is full of reminders of what God's done. But you need your own reminders. I'm going to take that picture and I'm going to go get it developed. For some kids. Yeah, developed is when you take it like to Walmart and they put it, in, instead of looking at it on a screen, it's actually on this like piece of paper that sometimes is a little shiny. And then you can put it in a frame and put it on the wall. It costs like a dime. You used to have to do that with every picture. You get a picture of your foot and you get it back from Walmart and go, that's my foot. I paid 10 cents for my foot. So you take those reminders and you put them on the wall. Some of you need to write down what God has done. Some of you need to take time today and say, God, remind me of what you've done. So what is your reminder? Some of you may actually need to get a rock from someplace you go and put it in your, by your front door to remind you of what God's done because he's going to take care of you in the future. Rick Warren says this, you were made by God and for God until you understand that life will ever make sense. Some of you, the reason you're sad and lonely today is not because there's anything wrong. It's because you're living for you. Did you catch that? We live in a world that thinks the world is about us. You know, it's funny to think years ago they thought the planets revolved around the earth. Well, now the kids think the planets revolve around them. 
You work with a teenager at a McDonald's and find out what's going on. They're like, I'm sorry, you should fit my schedule. You're like, what? I don't feel like flipping fries. What? They think the world's your all in it. But if we're not careful as adults, we can do the same thing. So number four, God is God and I am not. Everybody knows that. That's easy. But here's the deal. Most of the time when we pray, we pray, God, you do what I want and then I'll follow you. And God says, that's not how it works. You follow me and I'll do what I want. Listen to the end of this verse. Basically, Joshua is getting ready to go into Jericho and he meets this angel on the road. And he says, which side are you on? And here's what the angel says. Neither. He replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servants? So you can almost see Joshua. Joshua thinks he's on a kickball team, right? And so he says, we've chosen our side, right? We've got the one team over here and then the other team, Jericho team. Okay, we've chosen our team. We're ready to play kickball. And God's over here and says, uh, Joshua, uh, 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 which side are you on, God? Um, neither. Oh, well, we're going with you. And Joshua says, we're going with you. The problem in our lives is we're too busy praying that God would do our will instead of his will. Listen, sometimes when you pray for people and you ask for healing, God doesn't heal them. Sometimes they go to heaven, which is the best healing. I understand that, but not for you. Because you you want them around. Sometimes when you pray that God, you save this job or whatever, he doesn't do the things you want him to do. Why? Because you need to find out what he wants and go with him instead. And do what he wants in the middle of today. So quit thinking about what God didn't do for you yesterday. And instead say, God, you know what? I'm here and now and I want to go with you. Because when I don't go with you, things don't go well. Here's a little phrase I learned years ago. It's very simple. And this is one you can pray, you can tell God. And you may, be, you may need this one today. God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. God doesn't do things the way we want. He's eternal. He's all-powerful. That's omnipotent. He's, he's, he's omniscient. He knows everything. So, so you're not going to grasp God. You're not going to get it. My kids came to me years ago and said, Hey, tell us how the Trinity works. And I got started, and then I realized, um, and I tried to give them a theological answer, which is never good. I, I, I did the apple thing. But then I remember, oh, I had a seminary professor, not quite like an apple. Because you can't quite explain it three in one. How do you explain that? How do you explain how God knows everything, but he doesn't make you do anything? I don't. I go, I don't. I have a doctorate, and I go, oh. It's a good sound to make, by the way, so let's just try it. One, two, three. Oh. Most men were really good at that, by the way. That was... Number five, this is huge. This is huge. This is, this is the weakness in the church today. Church general. Number one, number five. I have to be willing to persevere. We've had people serve for one week at the doors. And somebody is not kind to them. And they throw, this happened, throw their bulletins down. I'm not helping it. I don't know why I'm doing it like a little kid. I'm not helping anymore. Listen. I had, a, this happened years ago too. I had a leader. A, a, a lady was in the nursery. She was changing diapers. She accidentally put the diaper on backwards. Now, I've changed a lot of diapers. When I put them on backwards, let me tell you what happened. They were backwards. <laughs> she handed the baby off to this person, and this person said, didn't even change the diaper right. Now, what the lady in the nursery wanted to say to her was, quit feeding your kids stinky junk before Sunday. I changed the poopiest Worst diaper I've ever changed. But she didn't say that. Instead, she came and said, Eric, I am not working in the nursery anymore. They complain that I put the diaper on backwards. So let me tell you what as a pastor I see happening. One day we go to heaven, okay? Because we're saved by grace and it's a good thing. So we get to heaven. And you walk up to a guy and you say, hey man, I don't know you. What's your name? Oh, my name's Bob. Hey Bob, how you doing? Good. Bob looks at you and goes... Let me just ask you, what's the worst thing that you ever had to deal with? Oh, man. Listen, I was working in the nursery one Sunday. And this parent, this parent yelled at me. Yes, asked what would you do? I quit. I never helped again. I told those people, if people are going to treat that way and act that way, I'm not helping again. I may not even come to church, but once a month or so, just you know, so I can feel spiritual. But I'm, you know, I'm not going to do that much anymore. Oh, that sounds pretty good. 
So, Bob, how about you? What's the worst thing that happened to you? Well, my children were fed to lions in front of me, and then I was fed to a lion and killed for my faith. Oh. Guess the diaper thing's not really a big deal to you, huh? Isn't it? So we have a perspective in life that's about us and gratification for us instead of what the Bible says. If you're a Christian, you take up your cross daily. It doesn't say take up your jacuzzi daily. It doesn't say to take up your back rub daily. It says take up your cross. That would be like today saying take up your electric chair daily and follow me. It is a struggle. And by the way, if you're not struggling and you're not dealing with tough things, you are not doing the Christian life right. Because if you're walking as a Christian, there is going to be tiredness some days. If you're walking, Jesus was tired. If you're walking as a Christian, there's going to be times where you don't want to persevere. You want to give up. You don't want to keep fighting sin. You don't want to keep doing what's right. The Israelites had to walk around seven times. A guy in the Bible had to dip himself seven times. Don't you think on the sixth time they were going, isn't that enough? And the enemy always whispers to you on the sixth time around and says, give up now. And that's when he's the loudest because he knows that the next time around the walls are going to fall. And some of you in an area of your life have been praying, you've been following through, but you're six times around and you're saying, I am not going around again. And God's going, just one more time. The angels in heaven are saying, just, just one more time. And here's what happened in Joshua chapter 6. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies and went. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted at the sound of the trumpet. When the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed and everyone went straight in. And they took the city. But don't you think after day one when they did the walk around full armor, those guys carrying the ark, 80 pounds apiece, walking around. Don't you think after the first day they were like, um, what's our strategy for tomorrow? Oh, man, we're going to get up in the morning and get all ready. Okay, that sounds good, Joshua. Okay, then what? Okay, then we're going to walk around. And? No, no, that's it. We're just going to walk around. What? Yeah, we're going to do that. Day three. So, Joshua, what's the plan for tomorrow? Okay, listen. <laughs> Let me tell you what's going This is awesome. In the morning, we're going to get up. You're all going to get ready. You're going to polish your swords. You're going to get all this stuff ready. You're going to get the ark ready. You guys, 80 pounds. You know, one arm, your left arm's getting huge. Your right arm's limpy. Left arm's huge. Could you go? Can we switch? Can we switch? Because i got to even these out. What are we doing? We're going to walk around. Okay, then what? That's it. Day six, same thing. By day six, you're going, okay, this guy needs medication. They don't even make it yet. Maybe we can just hit it, right? Seventh day, we're going to walk around seven times. Seven times? That's miles around a city and rough terrain. And the art carrying guys are 80 pounds each all day long. Yep. But then the walls are going to fall down. And that's what happened. You might be on the fifth time around. You might be on the sixth time around. You might be in the middle of the seventh time around. And the louder the enemy is, the closer you are to victory. So don't give up. Know that God is getting ready to do great things in your life. And that's why the enemy wants you to quit. When we were at camp, I was sitting down with Erica. And she was telling me a story uh, uh, about her life. And she said, um, Erica, I was going to quit children's ministry recently. And I went, oh, no. She said, oh, yeah. I said, why? She said, well, I just have too many responsibilities. I, I help at school. I'm one of the cheer coaches for Space Coast High School. And I, I think it's Space Coast High School. I hate to say that wrong. Some high school. And, and, um, and I, uh, my, it's, our family likes to go out of town once in a while. And it seems like every time we all have time, it's on the Sunday that I do fifth and sixth grade. So I was getting ready to go and tell Kyle, Kyle I quit. But then I prayed. And she said, and when I prayed, here's what God said. So you have time for everything else except for me. And she went, oh, slap in the head. That's what she said. Slap in the head. She said, and I knew I had to keep doing it. And God's taking care of her. Her husband actually missed her when she was gone. I know that's rare. He texted her and he said, I've not slept all week. Aww. Shut up. <laughs> And here's what I know when you sacrifice and serve God. Because she didn't even want to go to camp. When you sacrifice and serve God, he blesses you in other ways. Yes, you have to sacrifice. Yes, it's tiring. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's not easy. Yes, you want to quit. But yes, God will bless you. There's five truths to proclaim. Here they are. Number one, I can trust God with each challenge. 
God uses broken people, so you need to pray, God, please use me. Today, what are you thanking God for the miracle of? Put those reminders out. Remind yourself of what God's done. If you're going through a really hard time, make a list. Put it on the fridge. Put it on your forehead. Wherever you have to write it on your hands. Get a tattoo. I don't always understand God, but I trust Him. And then finally, God, help me persevere till the walls fall down. What's the wall in your life? You might be here today and maybe you're not a Christian. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. And maybe today you could say, I know about Jesus, but I've never surrendered my life to him. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but the truth is, when you sing, Lord, set a fire, you are lying. You are lying every time you sing that. You're like, Lord, give me a jacuzzi in my life to take it easy, not do a thing. I just want to sit here. I just want to sit here. Right? No. When you begin to pray, God, you light a fire in my life that I can't control. You do something with me you've never done. Lord, you impact my family. Use me. Lord, use me to be a blessing to be able to put people in my path that I can reach out to and love on and encourage. Lord, help my neighbors to be outside when I'm outside. Now that's a miracle in itself. And help me to be able to share with them what you're doing in my life. God will use you if you ask him but you can't be selfish and you can't be arrogant you have to be humble and say god i'm broken but you use me today if you want to give your life to christ today we're gonna to have a time of offering in just a second neil's gonna come and share a song with us one of the things in the song says i raise my ebenezer you know what that is that's where you took a stone and it, you put it there to remind you of what god had done so when he sings lord i raise my ebenezer it's the idea god i remember what you've done Maybe you're here today and after that song and after the time of giving, you want to come and say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you want to come and say, Eric, I've been lukewarm. I really want to be on fire for God. Would you pray that I would? And I'd love to pray for you today. Let's pray now. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word and your power. I thank you for what you did in our youth at camp. But I pray that fire from camp would spread through our church, that you would change us and that you would change our communities. Lord, I know you're getting ready to do great things here and in our lives. And I know the enemy hates that. And he wants to discourage and bring division and bring fighting and, and bring sin. So I pray in Jesus' name you would protect us by your angels. And Father, you'd work in lives. For that one who's feeling conviction today, I pray they would not... Just put it aside, but Father, they would repent and come to know you. Lord, I pray instead of spending eternity in hell, they would spend eternity in heaven because they surrender their heart to you. And Lord, today we ask that you would do new things in us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of giving. You give what God's put on your heart. What he tells you to give today. This is a great old song.